Um, and it's so good to see all of you and see so many people who are coming back for another time because uh, I recognize you from times before. So my name is Connie Lester. Uh, I'm the editor of the Florida Historical Quarter. Uh, I am a, I'm an associate professor in the history department and the director of the Riches Digital Project. And uh, the Schaffner Lecture came about because of the quarterly. Uh, we were, uh, it was in 2013, and the state was celebrating its 500th anniversary of the landing of Ponce de Leon on the peninsula. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the state had all kinds of, uh, of great plans for things we ought to do. They weren't funding it, of course, but they had great plans for things we, we should do to celebrate this 500th anniversary. Uh, and so we decided in the quarterly we would celebrate it by uh, having five special issues, one each year for five years. Well, actually there were six because we, we divided the 19th century. It was just too big to do, to do everything we wanted to do with it. Uh, but, but for five years we had a special issue every year. Uh, and um, uh, it was um, edited by someone whose expertise was in that area. And, um, and they really turned out well. And for those of you who are graduate students, you should know that the editor of each one of them wrote a really fantastic historiographic essay. So if you're doing Florida history, you ought to look at those essays, you know? You got half your research done right there. Uh, but anyway, um, we did that. And um, they came out in the winter um, each time. And so our first one came out, and it was well received, and we decided we would do a lecture uh, that fall and have the editor of that first issue do the lecture. And then we, it, it went over so well, we decided we'd do it for all the rest of them. And then when it got to the end of, of that project, um, we liked it, so we just kept going. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and we've had a, a large number of well-known scholars who have passed this way and we've been very grateful for it. Uh, I'll tell you just a little bit about Gerald Schaffner. I won't repeat the joke I told last year, so those of you who heard it can just, you don't have to worry about it. Uh, but I, um, and, and those who didn't hear it, you can talk to me later and I'll be glad to tell you. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but uh, Gerald Schaffner uh, was one of those scholars who was, who was unique in, in many ways. Um, he, he concentrated his entire career on Florida. And, you know, that can spell doom to a scholar sometimes, you know, you're just identified as too local, that doesn't mean anything. But that wasn't true for Gerald Schaffner. As the editor of the Quarterly, I have many times the opportunity to, to consult his work again. And every time I consult it, every time I come across uh, one of his publications, I realized how forward-thinking he was. There are scholars now who are just now figuring out what Gerald Schaffner figured out in the 1970s. And, uh, and nationally known, internationally known scholars recognize that about him, and he is cited still over and over again. He was chair of the department for many years. Um, he was also, along with um, Dean Jose Fernandez, um, they were responsible for uh, bringing the quarterly from UF to UCF. Uh, and um, so it seemed appropriate uh, that when we named uh, the lectureship that we would name it for Gerald Schaffner. And I feel compelled that, that every generation should know about him and, and know the work that he did um, because it was so good. He was also president of the Florida Historical Society for a while too. Um, so there are lots of connections here um, between him and, and us today. Um, so I need to thank some people. That's, that's always a good thing to be able to do. So first of all, I, you know, this is only the second year that the Schaffner Lecture has been uh, in conjunction with the Florida Historical Society uh, annual meeting and symposium. Um, in the past, it was, a, it was always on a Monday. Uh, a Monday evening. Uh, so this is the, only the second time we've done it this way. And so I feel like we've had our first day of the annual meeting and I feel like I need to thank the presenters and the chairs of all of those panels that met today. Thank you very, very much. I 
I, of course, did not get to attend any of them because I was running around. Um, but uh, but I, as I peeked in, people seemed very engaged, and they would come out of the session all excited and talking about what they had just heard. So that's always a good sign. So I want to I want to thank those presenters and and chairs, and I want to thank the audiences for being there uh, because I have had the experience of giving a paper to one person, uh, and uh, <laughs> that is not fun. Uh, that is not fun at all. Um, but the, each of the panels had a number of people in the audience and, and they were, as I said, very engaged. I also want to thank the Department of History, uh, John Satcher, who is the interim chair, uh, because our previous chair abandoned us for the dean's office, but that, that's another story we'll get into later. Uh, but uh, John Satcher, who's the interim chair, uh, uh, Syrah Amoshekia, who is the office um, administrator, uh, Jesse Oldham, um, who is the program uh, uh, manager, and uh, uh, Katarina Monroe, who is our assistant, our administrative assistant. And, you know, I really owe these women big time. Next week I'm going to have to pay off. Uh, and, so, uh, and so I'm thinking some kind of lunch or something nice, flowers maybe, you know, something. I, I, I'm really indebted to these women and I do appreciate every single thing you've done. Um, yes, let's give them a <laughs> Uh, I also uh, want to thank the Dean's Office, uh, Dean, Jeff uh, Dean Jeff Moore. Um, that was such a hard thing to say, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, anyway, um, he's always been supportive of the things that we do and supportive of the quarterly, and we do appreciate that. Lyman Brody, who's Executive Associate Dean, and who's going to give us a few words in a minute. And uh, Peter Larson, who abandoned us in the History Department when I went to the Dean's Office and is now an associate dean. Uh, and I also want to thank someone who's not here, but who has been important for us, and that's Heather Gibson, who's the Director of Marketing and Communication, who has put out information about the meeting and the Schaffner Lecture over and over again, and we do appreciate that. Some of you are here because you read something she wrote about it, and, and we appreciate that. Uh, the Florida Historical Society is here, and so I want to thank the executive director, Brent Ben Brokemarkle, and if you would stand up, because probably some people don't know who you are. Um, we have the current president and the incoming president, and it will be a smooth transition of power. Um, Maurice O'Sullivan, if you would stand, he's the president. He's from Arlington. And James M. Mike Denham, who is the incoming president. And he is uh, I also want all the members of the board who are here uh, to stand up as well. They come, they come from across the state and from out of state to be here. And so I'm, I'm grateful um, that they're here. Uh, I'm also grateful, and they're not here. They're taking, uh, they're putting things away from the night and, and going home to get a good night's sleep. But uh, the Florida Historical Society staff have been working all day long. And they, if you, you went to the registration table, wait, there are two people of the staff who stand up. <laughs> that I had to remember that because both of them are my master's students. <laughs> um, anyway, um, they have been working all day long, and if you haven't been by the bookstore, you haven't stopped by to talk with them, do that tomorrow um, because you'll find that they're just uh, wonderful people. Um, so, let's get on with our panel now, you know, before it gets to be supper time. And, you know. Anyway, uh, so, um, I want to have, uh, first, see, I made fun of you because I couldn't remember the order. Uh, but I want uh, Dr. Satcher to come and make the presentation. I will, I, will yeah, I will extend our welcomes. We welcome you a lot here at UCF. So first of all, most impressively, you have found room 402 of the library. So that's definitely a good accomplishment. Um, 
literally last week at this exact same time, I was at an event like this at the University of Mississippi, and we have better attendance here, more students here, better food here. <laughs> so I think overall, this is a very impressed, I'm very impressed to see this group out here on Friday. Um, and so as the chair of the history department, I thank you all for coming. Uh, also, for those of you, as Connie talked about, the Florida Historical Society, of course, the meeting of the uh, panels continue, not just today, but if you were back here at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning, you can see more panels, particularly uh, Civil War and Civil Rights would be a good one to go to, because I'm chairing that panel, um, so I recommend that one, but yes. Um, definitely welcome. I'm glad you're all to come out here on a Friday afternoon. And the history department, of course, supports this. While well, I'm interim chair now, I was chair when this started, I believe. Um, but really, we could not do it without the support of the College of Arts and Humanities. So I'm going to turn it over to Lyman Brody, who will also welcome you. <laughs> you see the song, right? Thank you very much. All right. As he says, we welcome people over and over and over again. Um, I want to thank you all for being here because I'm, I have a particular interest in Florida as my family goes back well over 100 years in Florida and primarily in Tampa. So I've done a number of things where I've found a, a great deal of research at Florida Southern that actually has pictures of me in the high school band <laughs> at band festivals. You know, so, so I have a definite interest in all of that. Um, I should tell you in deference to my own department of music, that uh, I'm really an amateur historian. <laughs> <laughs> so, and also, uh, in reference to what I'm hoping to hear from the panel, you know, my family's name is Acosta. So I'm also interested in the, in the connections that we all share. So thank you all for being here. I'm looking forward to the presentation, and, uh, and this is going to be another great conference. Thank you so much. OK, so now I'm going to introduce the introducer of the panel. Okay. <laughs> we, we like to make it complicated. You know? um, so Dr. Luis Martinez Fernandez is a historian. By the way, I took this off his site, and I did cut it down, <laughs> so we could get on with it. Uh, but he is a historian, nationally syndicated columnist, consultant, and public speaker, uh, whose fields comprise, uh, whose fields of expertise include uh, Latin America, the Caribbean, uh, education, and uh, Latino Hispanic politics, culture, and society. He is a Pegasus professor at the University of Central Florida. That's enough. You don't want me to tell about your books? You don't want to tell me all the good stuff? All right, you can see me afterwards again. <laughs> Thank you very much, Connie. And uh, I think you deserve a hand. Yes. It takes a lot of time, effort, energy to organize this, so we appreciate you doing this. Uh, the Shotman Lecture is one of the two pillars of intellectual outreach from our department. The other one being the poly lectures. So it's, it's, it's an opportunity for us to reach out and connect with other scholars and the audience. Uh, I'm not going to read resumes. I don't like introducing people that way. But and those who know me know that I like to tell stories. So I'm going to turn this into a little story. <clears throat> because uh, this is the, the full circle, uh, the field of Central Florida Puerto Rican studies did not exist before 2004. And it was about time. And I joined the Latin American Studies program and we pushed for a studies, uh, Puerto Rican Studies Center, which finally materialized under the leadership of Fernando Rivera, the Puerto Rico hub. But it was a long story. And I remember when I got here in 2004, and there were others outside of Florida who were interested in, in promoting this new field. And that included Jorge Duani from Florida International University and also Hunter College. So it was with their help and support and inspiration that we began to basically write the first things ever on the history of Puerto Ricans 
in Central Florida, which was a long history. And now, all these years later, 15, 16 years later, we, we find that the field has matured. And an example of that is two excellent books that appeared on Puerto Ricans in Central Florida in the year 2020. And I'll read the titles in just, just a minute. Uh, Patricia Silver was one of those founders. Um, we were fortunate to have her here at the University of Central Florida from 2005 to 2009. Again, those were the beginnings, and she brought her er energy and her knowledge. Um, she was a leader in some of the oral history projects, which students and the public in general are still benefiting from those materials that, that you collected. And the 2020 book, Sunbelt Diaspora, Race, Class, and Latino Politics in Puerto Rico, Orlando. It's nice that you have the same order as in the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that was on purpose. What are the odds? Oh, so Simon de Lerme, uh, we have a few things in common because she got her degree at Rutgers University where I taught uh, for, for 10 years. And I met her, I think it was 2005, maybe 2006, but I think it's 2005. Uh, you know, when people would come to my office and doesn't sound good for me to say, but I, I became sort of the to-go place for Puerto Rican studies. And she contacted me, and we had coffee, and we talked about her project. And all these years later, well, she is uh, an endowed professor, associate professor at the University of Mississippi. And um, her book, which came out the same year, is called, is entitled Latino Orlando. Suburban Transformation and Racial Conflict in 2020, which I was able to write a review on, a very glowing one, if I, if I recall correctly. And one of her major contributions is that she has forced Central Florida Puerto Ricans into Southern history. We never thought, you know, people didn't think along those lines, but it is Southern history. Um, our next presenter, presenter, it's hard to paper and microphone at the same time, Elizabeth Aranda from the University of South Florida. She got her PhD from Temple University. And she is the director of the Immigrant Wellbeing Research Center. So I guess you're going to be very, very busy for a long time uh, as the need uh, grows. Her book, Emotional Bridges to Puerto Rico, Return Migration, and the Struggles for Incorporation. So this is as good as panels get. So let's pay attention and let's give them a warm welcome. Proportions 
and numbers. Um, but then, you know, not far behind, you have uh, Polk County, Hillsborough County, where Tampa is. Polk is in the center between Orlando and Tampa. But then further down south, you have uh, Broward County, where Fort Lauderdale is. And, um, you know, you have Miami and where Palm Beach is just slightly above Fort Lauderdale. But, you know, these areas are filling in. Uh, you know, the, the key me uh, metropolitan statistical areas that you see the most proportions growing are around the Southern Miami Broward, Orlando MSA, and the Tampa St. Petersburg Clearwater MSA. But as you can see, you go further north, you see Jacksonville area is starting to, you know, Florida is the to-go state for Puerto Ricans now. And it's not just those coming from Puerto Rico, it's those also coming from New York, California. Uh, what's that? California. California even. Uh, I just read an article about that. They're no longer going to Texas, they're coming to Florida, those leaving California. Not just Puerto Ricans, but people in general, right? Uh, and just to give you a sense of what led to that map you just saw, uh, these are what it looked like at these different points in time. Um, so, you know, there's a history of this. Um, you mentioned your last name, Acosta. Um, they're, they're intersecting histories, right? Um, so we, we will get into a little bit of that in our discussion. I think that was the last slide we had. Yeah. Uh, so what we're gonna try to do is put these two books in conversation with one another. Uh, so I've tried to select um, questions that will do that. And in some cases, some questions are really geared to one book and you know, so so I just wanted to start with like a basic one, which is what gets you to research what you what you do, right? There's always a personal connection. I, I don't personally believe we can always be truly objective because even in selecting the research question, there's some sort of bias leading us there. Uh, not to say that you're biased, but, <laughs> um, but what motivated you to study the Puerto Rican diaspora in Central Florida? So whoever wants to begin. Yeah, I can go first, and it was personal, it really was. My interest in migration is connected to my family's history. I'm third generation, I was born in East Harlem, New York, um, but my father's side of the family is from Puerto Rico, my mother's side of the family is from Haiti, both my parents grew up in New York. Um, so I was interested in migration, especially because when I was young we moved to Delaware, to Wilmington, Delaware, where there was a black-white racial binary, and people didn't know how to make sense of me. Um, because there wasn't a Puerto Rican or even a larger Latino population. And so my happiness was going to New York on weekends where I could see family um, and I could be immersed in a Puerto Rican concentrated community. And so as I got older, I always knew I wanted to study migration in some context, um, but I never thought it would be Florida. I just knew it was going to be New York City, East Harlem. So when I did my PhD at Rutgers, I went with every intention of studying New York um, I was living in East Harlem, New York while I was doing my degree, and I realized that the Puerto Rican population was leaving, and I wanted to study urban revitalization and gentrification. I wanted to understand what was happening to that community and those changes. But then the census data started to come out, and people like Jorge Buani started writing about Puerto Ricans in Florida, and I realized that the population I was trying to study in New York City, including my family, were heading south to Orlando. So I switched up really quickly. Uh, and in particular, there were three things that drew my attention that Jorge Duani pointed out. The first thing that he pointed out was that Puerto Ricans in Orlando, Florida, were less segregated than those in New York City from non-Hispanic white communities. They were moving to suburbs. For me, that was groundbreaking because I was so used to an urban context. And he also talked about them being professionals and managers and being upwardly mobile. And this middle class status being important to the push-pull factors. And for me, East Harlem had always been this laboratory, in a lot of ways, to study poverty, drug abuse, crime, all of these negative things about the Puerto Rican community. So I finally had an opportunity uh, to look at people that were perhaps upper class or upwardly mobile, people that maybe look like my family who were moving to the suburbs uh, and leaving New York. So for me, I realized there was this shift happening. People are migrating south. And so I wanted to follow the migration. Uh, and I decided to move to Buenaventura Lakes in Osceola County to do my field work there. 
So it was definitely about family and that connection to migration. Um, also following the numbers and realizing there might be something different about this particular migration in comparison to Chicago or New York. Great, thanks. How about you, Patricia? So mine's a very different story. <laughs> um, I'm not Puerto Rican, I'm not Latina. Um, I, I came to Florida, I came to Orlando in 2005 as a newly minted PhD, um, I was an older graduate student, um, so I was an older newly minted PhD, but I had been living in Puerto Rico where I had done my dissertation uh, field work with, a, uh, with the school reform project going on there in the 1990s. And, um, the position here was a four-year visiting position, and my um, advisor at the time, my dissertation advisor, was like, okay, write your book on the school reform project and move on. And um, that didn't happen quite that way. I was trying to write about school reform in Puerto Rico in the 1990s while I was sitting in the middle of Orlando with everything that was going on here. So it didn't happen quite that way. Um, it was My process was a very organic process. I didn't really start research with a particular focus, and um, Dr. Martinez Fernandez and other people when I got here was saying, you have to study this, this is going on, you have to pay attention. And, um, and Jorge Guani had been somebody I'd spent a lot of time with in Puerto Rico, actually, too, so, um, so I was familiar with that. But I didn't know a lot of what was going on here, and it was a very slow process. I had a, my position here was um, teaching at a lot of different regional campuses, so I had a lot of time in the car. Um, and driving all over and not very much time to really kind of settle in and make this at home. So, so in the process of that, it was very slow and I, you know, I'd meet, if I'd meet somebody who was Puerto Rican, I'd be like, oh, where are you from? And why did you come here? You know, so I had those kinds of questions going on, but it was a very slow process. And um, what did come out of that is that the narrative, what, what started to sound like a narrative to me, a lot of people were saying, well, um, there's this, this Puerto Ricans started kind of coming here in the 1980s, and it's a professional migration, and it really blossomed in the 1990s, and that's when it's really grew. And that that's not, by any means, not true. However, I kept finding other things that didn't go with that narrative. Like, I met a couple of people who were born here in the 1940s, the Puerto Rican parents. And so I, I, I had a sense that there was more to the story, but I didn't have a lot of time at first to get started. It took a few years. Um, and I'd say two things happened that really kind of started it off, and, um, and I certainly wasn't going to focus on politics. I had figured out quickly that was something to stay away from, and um, that, was, that was kind of scary as a non-Puerto Rican, non-Latino, stepping into Orlando, not knowing a lot about Florida. That was just not somewhere I wanted to go. Clearly, from the title of my book, I went there, but um, <laughs> it took a while. So two things happened early on. A couple, I'd been here a couple years. I had a little bit more kind of control over my daily life, and I got a phone call one night from a woman I had met um, long ago. I barely even remembered. I think I'd met her once or twice, and she was talking very rapidly in Spanish and saying, "You have to come with us. We're going on a bus to Brooksville. There's a protest happening tomorrow, and we want you to come." So of course, I'm an anthropologist. I hopped on the bus and I went, <laughs> um, and uh, that. When I, on that bus, I met a lot of people that I hadn't met before, and I had been a bit confused by some of what was going on in Puerto Rico and Orlando, and uh, there I met a bunch of activists, people who were really, they were out protesting, they, they were upset because this Florida congresswoman had called Puerto Ricans uh, foreign citizens, and they were, gonna, they were gonna make noise about, these were noisemakers. I hadn't met many noisemakers yet at that point. Except that maybe Dr. Martinez Fernandez. He <laughs> makes noise in a very good way. Um, so anyway, so on the bus to Brooksville, I met a lot of people, and, and I think that made a major difference, including one woman who ended up later running for a uh, political position. She's been elected several times, and she invited me into the campaign to, to work with her, and so that all taught me a lot. But at about that same time, um, I also had met Dr. Under, Natalie Underberg, Good, who uh, is a folklorist and at that point had something called the Digital Ethnography Lab here at University of Central Florida. And uh, we had been talking about doing an oral history project. I had this sense that there was more to, more than just to that narrative. And uh, we, I mentioned it to some people on the bus and I'm thinking, you know, they're going to say, you know, say hey, yeah, who does she think she is? This, you know, Gringa coming in here asking us questions. They were thrilled. They loved the idea. Um, they were really excited that somebody was going to do a project like so, so we did, we got funding from the Florida Humanities Council and we put out a press release and said, you know, have you been in 
are you Puerto Rican and have you are you over 18 years old and have you did you come somewhere between um, which obviously they would have had to be over 18 did you come sometime between 1940 and 1980 and we thought we didn't know if we'd get five people or 500 well we were inundated with phone calls and we had to very quickly train graduate students um, so it was a wonderful experience for them and um, hire an office manager just to keep track of it all and, and keep it going so. So from there, um, then I got to know a lot of people, and they just kept pulling me into politics. <laughs> so that ended up um, being a major focus of what I was doing. Thank you. Um, you each use multiple methods to answer your research questions. And so I'm wondering, is there a particular method that you found useful to study Puerto Ricans at that moment in time? Uh, Patricia, do you want to start? Sure. I have my cheat sheets here because I do tend to ramble on and I sometimes forget the questions. So I did take, we, we had fun kind of co constructing this. We were doing Zooms and mm -hmm. talking about all the research we've all done. And so we've had kind of a good time. So I have my cheat sheets. So, <laughs> so yeah, I think I, I, well, my process, as I say, was an organic process and I, I took a very long time to do it. I think I, it was like 15 years or so before I felt I was ready to write a book. So I wouldn't recommend that path. Don't do it that way. <laughs> So, I mean, I, I did ethnographic field work, I did archival work, I was studying the census, I was reading newspapers, and as I drove all over Central Florida from campus to campus, I did a lot of listening to Spanish radio. Uh, but I think that the, the method I'd most like to talk about is oral history, uh, which really did, uh, I think, ground a lot of my work. And, and it, it goes back to that narrative of professional migration in the 80s and the 90s, and my sense that that wasn't quite right. And along with meeting people who had been here longer than that. Also, even people who'd come more recently or come in the 90s, say, I am not asking them why they came. And frequently, part of their story was, well, there was somebody in my family already here, or there was somebody you know, that I knew who was already here. So clearly, there was something uh, longer going on. And But I'm you know, looking in the archives, I'm, looking, I'm not finding a background to those stories. Um, and so oral history seemed to me to be the way to, to come up, to follow those stories and find out. Of course, one individual story doesn't tell you what actually happened in history, right? But, but gathering the stories of people who were able to kind of tell history in their own way, to me, became very valuable. So um, I had a colleague at the time, Rosalind Howard, um, may she rest in peace. She uh, was, at that point, um, do, using oral history as part of her work to trace black Seminoles from the Sarasota area to the Bahamas. And she was able to, between doing that work here and then with her prior work in the Bahamas, she was able to actually piece together people's histories and their families that they had lost track of. And I, just, I thought that was so amazing and so exciting and so it got me. I didn't know a lot about oral history, but I was like, I'm an anthropologist, I must know how to do that. And so I started, um, I started learning more about that. And along with that, in uh, in Puerto Rico, for Puerto Ricans, and especially for the kind of field of Puerto Rican studies, which really emerged out of New York and the Puerto Ricans that had, had moved there in the 50s and 60s, um, oral history has been a really long tradition. So it's not so much about this moment in time as um, this particular place and this particular group of people, I think. Um, oral history has been a way, traditionally, that Puerto Ricans have been able to write their own histories, um, which particularly in the beginning, the early kind of social science of Puerto Rican movements to the United States um, was not in Puerto Rican voices. And oral history became a way, way to do that. So, um, And just one final, I'm not going on too long, but, but along with that, after four years at UCF, I then um, moved to New York to Hunter College to the Center for Puerto Rican Studies, and I was a research associate there. And um, that, as I say, that's really where Puerto Rican studies had emerged from as, as a study of the diaspora. And I found that my colleagues there, who had spent their lives immersed in this and knew way more than I was ever going to know, um, still tended to see what was going on in Florida through a, a New York lens. Mm -hmm. And they tended to want to ask the same kinds of questions. And I just knew that probably wasn't right, but I, I had too much respect for them to really push back because they were all senior scholars who had been doing this all their lives and they were Puerto Rican and I was not. So, so that, that became part, that was part of it. And so the oral histories really became the way that I could find, that I could 
come up with the questions that needed to be asked, I hoped. That, that, that by, by listening to the stories that people told me of what their lives had been here, it helped me look more for patterns and start to think about larger research. Uh, and for me, I used a mixed method approach. I started with U.S. Census data, American Community Survey data, just to get a sense of numbers. I wanted to see where the concentrations were, and that's how I found Buena Ventura Lakes as one of the suburbs that I could potentially study. Um, I spent an entire semester looking at just newspaper articles, uh, Orlando Sentinel going as far back as I could just to get a sense of push-pull factors, um, what kind of talk there was about the Puerto Ricans that were coming to uh, Orlando in increasing numbers. But one of the most helpful methods for me um, was the informal methods, doing participant observation. And I'm trained as a cultural anthropologist. And what I found, um, other scholars, anthropologists, have referred to it as an incarvado system. Uh, but what I found in one of Ventura Lakes, for instance, is that you would have homeowners or people who are renting a home. And they would just um, break up the home in a way where they could rent other rooms or even the garage and turn that into a living space. And that was entrepreneurship for them. That was a way that they paid the mortgage or they paid the rent. And so I went looking for a space that I could rent with other folks so I could then do snowball sampling and use those folks I was living with to learn more about the community uh, at large. And so I was fortunate to find um, a home in Buena Ventura Lakes. It was owned by a young Venezuelan immigrant. Um, he was in his late 20s and he rented one room um, to an undocumented Mexican migrant who was working in the hospitality industry and then I rented the other room. My father was terrified. He's ex-military, went in there, was making sure there were no two-sided mirrors or anything strange going on. Um, and it was a risk. I did not know who I was moving in with. Um, but they ended up being the people who really helped me get grounded. And they gave me the perspective of a larger Latino population, which was really helpful because then I got to see interactions and perceptions of Puerto Ricans from folks that were not Puerto Rican. So those informal interviews that I was able to do, you know, just everyday life situations where people are communicating to me, and I'm writing it in my field notes later in the evening, was very, very powerful. The other thing I really ended up relying on um, were online forums and blogs. There was one site called citydata.com, and it was a site where people would ask questions about different places or spaces around the country. And I found one of Ventura Lakes, I found Osceola County, I found all kinds of spaces and places in Central Florida um, where people were thinking of moving there and they would just post, um, you know, I found a really cheap house in one of Ventura Lakes. Is that a good neighborhood? What can you tell me about it? And the comments were anonymous and they were the best data I got throughout my research because under those anonymous usernames, people felt more comfortable speaking their truth about their perceptions, about race relations. Uh, and so through those online forums, I started to really follow um, what people were saying about the community, about Puerto Rican people. Uh, and again, I had to document it, I had to code it. Um, but again, those anonymous comments ended up being very, very powerful uh, in understanding how people were receiving the population that was migrating here. Thank you. Are there differences uh, in terms of what you both found uh, between the reasons for migration for islanders and those coming from New York and then Rafiki's? Uh, similar view. Yeah, in my research, the newspaper articles were very informative about pushable factors. Um, one of the things that I did not expect to find was the significance of real estate and realtors and very direct recruitment strategies. So when I was in Buena Ventura Lakes, I had a chance to interview one of the people who was behind the development uh, of Buena Ventura Lakes. And I got to interview folks who moved there. And they told me about newspaper articles where, you know, very intentionally they were being recruited to go look at property, um, you know, lights covered for them, somewhere to stay in terms of the hotel, just for them to go and take a look. So people told me about the New York Times and New York Post and all these advertisements that would be in Chicago, that would be in New York City. So I found that real estate was important. And that's about late 70s, early 80s. Uh, and it continued. So that was one of the things that I saw in the Northeast. It was folks that were being very directly recruited. Uh, and with one of the tour lakes, then they ended up um, contracting with realtors in Puerto Rico. 
So I found real estate to be very, very important for folks uh, because they could get, especially when they were lakes, they talked about Landstar homes and how it was a lifestyle of luxury. There was a country club. Um, you could have that American dream with the two-car garage and the lawn, but you could not get in New York City. And it was affordable in comparison. You could be a homeowner for the first time. So I found that appeal to people. Um, when I was looking at newspaper articles in particular around Puerto Rico, the thing that struck me was the crime talk. Not that there necessarily was more crime, but there was this fear of crime that was pushing people. Um, there was also a lot of recruitment in terms of the hospitality industry, um, you know, Disney offering people money if they had family members that would come over. And as the population increased, there was just a greater need for bilingual workers. So it just kind of escalated. So I saw recruitment in terms of labor, I saw recruitment in terms of real estate, fear of crime. Uh, and as I read newspaper articles, there would be terminologies like the frontier. Florida was a frontier, and I remember reading about that. Uh, and it was a place for new opportunities. You know, you could be the first restaurant owner that had authentic Puerto Rican cuisine because it wasn't already concentrated, like it was in New York City, for example. So it was a place that, that had a lot of opportunities for folks, and I saw that um, as very influential. Yeah, so um, that does a lot. <laughs> so what I want to do is just do a little bit of a walk through time because um, I do, because of the work with the oral history projects that had people talking about what brought them earlier. Um, and um, I'm, I'm just going to touch on a few. One of them is, of course, the development, the housing developments. That's a, a huge piece of it. And I, I think I even had evidence of that back into the 60s. I'm not sure. But, um, but one of the big pieces that surprised me was the military. Um, and back in the, in, of course, in the 1940s, it's World War II, and um, the, there were Puerto Ricans stationed in Florida, of course, the U.S. citizens are in the Army, they're going to be stationed in Florida. There was one person um, who actually had been transferred, this is later, this is during the Cuban Missile Crisis, he'd been um, transferred from California to Florida, and in his case, he was very bilingual, and he, he assumed that that was part of why he'd been, taken, he'd been sent to Florida, and then he ended up staying here. That, that happened to many people. There were also um, uh, U.S. soldiers who were stationed in Puerto Rico and met their spouses there and moved, if they were from Florida or maybe for another reason later, came to Florida. So I, there were actually quite a few people that I met who, who were, uh, but had, for women, who had come early on for that reason. They'd been married to somebody that they had met, they were in Puerto Rico and they had met a soldier and, and moved here. Um, so then, of course, the housing, which someone has described beautifully, um, and, and Disney, when, when that started, I think, 73 that started, is that right when that opened? Um, and, of course, that's, a, that's for both tourists and jobs, um, people coming for that reason. And um, it's a lot, several people saying, I came for a Disney vacation and I stayed. Um, one story is of somebody who literally found herself a job like that weekend or something, and <laughs> they decided not to go back. I don't know. I, there are a lot of stories about people not finding jobs that easily, but this was one person who was able to do that. And of course, the, the kind of chain migration, in a sense, that, that um, and we're, we're looking at pulls with that, right? These are all things that would be bringing people here. Um, but if they're with the pushes that are going on at the same time, and there's somebody already there, Florida starts to feel familiar and possible. Um, so that's, I'm looking at maybe up until about the 1980s, right? So in the 80s and 90s, um, <clears throat> I think we have to, I'm looking a little bit at the pushes that might, and I'm kind of stepping back a bit and looking at that larger, I have a room full of historians, so I don't need to tell you, step back and think about that larger scene. Um, but there's this, this shifting economic landscape going on in the 80s and 90s, right? And um, it's, it's really, it's, it struck me somewhere along the line in doing all this work that, that the, the movement of not only of Puerto Ricans to Florida, but of Latinos to the United States, that this is happening kind of in sync with the emergence of neoliberalism and the global economy and the kinds of global movements that, that we've been seeing. Um, and so Puerto Ricans coming to, to uh, Florida are part of that. And there's pushes that are happening both from New York and from Puerto Rico that might sound different but I think are very related to that, that historic movement. And um, so in, I mean, in, uh, well, not just New York, but in the North, in Chicago, in the Northwest, the, the Midwest, and the, sorry, the Midwest and the Northeast, 
the decline of unions was a huge factor of people. And, and at the same time that they were declining there, of course, the pull is to the south, right, where there's right to work states and um, that, that's a shift in, in uh, where the jobs are. Um, and in Puerto Rico, this is a little bit later, it's in the mid-90s, there's an end of the tax breaks to U.S. corporations. There's a 10-year phase out. So that had been a huge employer in Puerto Rico for a very long time. And, and companies started to leave uh, during that time. I was doing work in Puerto Rico, I actually, this was very disturbing to me. Uh, a family friend, somebody about my age, somebody I'd known since I was a small child, was working for Procter & Gamble. And his job, he was in Puerto Rico all the time because his job was to move people out. Um, and he was trying desperately to get them jobs other places, but Procter & Gamble was leaving Puerto Rico. So, so that, um, I, I think, it starts looking like the pushes are different, what's happening in the Northeast and what's happening, or, well, let's say in Northern U.S. And, and what's happening in Puerto Rico, but I think they're very related. And it's, it's this time where um, there's historical trajectories that are drawing political and economic energies and new populations to the U.S. Southeast, and then Puerto Ricans in Central Florida are part, part of all of that. Um, so there's just one other point I want to make about that in terms of, of um, where people are coming from, and that is that, um, and we might talk about this a little bit more later too, but so Central Florida becomes a place for Puerto Ricans, at least coming from all these different places, that's new to both. It's new to everybody, right? It's not, it's not Puerto Ricans moving to New York where there's already a community. It's not New York Ricans relocating to, to back, back to uh, Puerto Rico. It's people coming from lots of places with lots of different experiences but they're coming to a new place where new have not have been. So speaking of that new place, it's, it's the South, right? And, mm -hmm. and it's sort of a white-black binary. And you both talk about Puerto Ricans integrating into that white-black binary. Can you speak a little bit about this process? Did they, and if so, how did they subvert this binary? Patricia, do you want to start me to this is a long one for me. I just talked a long time, so I'll, oh. <laughs> I'll, um, I'll try to not do that. But I do it. That's part of why I have my cheat sheet because I feel like my book is all about that, and I could talk for a really long time, and I could get really incoherent trying to point things together. So I do have some notes I want to try to try to follow. And what I'd like to do is kind of walk you again through um, what I refer to as a movement of this is about Puerto Rican racial identity in Central Florida as something going from kind of invisibility the hypervisibility to efforts to make visibility in their own terms, right? So uh, I see that as kind of a historical pr progression, but before I do that, I have to point out a couple of things. Um, one is a reminder um, that Puerto Rican experience in the U.S. is and always has been impacted by an encounter of two different racial schemas, right? We're talking about the black-white binary that is so, um, steeped in, in or U.S. history has been so marked by the one, one drop rule and so forth. Um, but in Puerto Rico, there's a racial continuum. Which is not to say there's not colorism, it's not to say there's not discrimination, there's not a quote unquote preference for whiteness. This happens, certainly. But there's a recognition that your own, your, any, anybody's racial identity might fall somewhere on the whole continuum from black to white. Um, and I think that that encounter for Puerto Ricans who then come to the U.S., it, it probably has, I mean, you all need to, it just needs to be studied. <laughs> that encounter, I think, probably has produced all kinds of uh, things, and I'll, I'll talk about some of them. But, so then I want you to take that ever-present encounter going on between these two different racial schemas and put that into the space, um, which is the South, and where that black-white binary is cod was codified for a long time in Jim Crow laws. Um, and in many ways is still ongoing in legal structures, not just in attitudes and so forth, but in legal structures. And I, I could do, what I, I have one example I'll give. Part of my book is actually about a redistricting process that happened, um, there was a lawsuit against Orange County and after the 2010 redistricting for the county commission um, that, um, that Latino justice was saying that Orange County had divided up the Latino vote. I'm not going to go into that because I could talk about that way too long, but I, but it's, some, it's, it's somewhere where I saw, I watched it happen, the black-white binary playing out with that. Um, a, a much shorter example is something, and again, early on in, in my research, so we're looking at 2005 or so, when I came here, 
there was a, um, Alicia might remember more about this. So there was a, there's a school committee in Orange County Public Schools that um, dated from desegregation. And it was um, supposed to have an equal number of black and white parents. And it was, they made recommendations for school openings, closings, I'm not sure what else. And when I, soon after I got here, there was a big group ha ha about it because there had been one, the, the committee had become kind of defunct. It wasn't happening a whole lot. And, um, and they had like a meeting, maybe one or two people showed up. I don't think anybody black was there. I think it was two white people. They decided to close schools. The decisions were made. And the decisions were impacting the Puerto Ricans. They were impacting the, in their schools. And there was a big uproar, and they wanted to be part of the committee, understandably. Once the, the committee got kind of discovered, like I think people had forgotten it even existed. So they wanted to be part of that. And uh, there was a long thing about it, and I don't think they ever got on the committee. They were told at one point, you have to be black or white. And again, this was law that had, or you know, uh, yeah, a law that had been, and I think it was actually in, in a legal structure, but certainly a rule and a procedure that had been based in a history. And they were basically said, "You're not part of this history. You can't, you can't now join this this group." Um, so that's a, that's my kind of caveat before I walk through. And I, I this part I actually can do fairly quickly. I'd say from the 1940s until early 80s is the time I talk about invisibility. Now the people who participated in our oral history project, self-selected, we asked for people and they volunteered. And um, these, the people that were there before, in, in these earliest years, were clearly living on the white side of the color line. Um, some of them, there was one man in particular who talked about being teased. He was born in the 1940s in Sanford. And he talked about being teased for his tan skin. But, it, but he was living on the white side of the color line. He wasn't, you know, he might have had some difficulties, but it was nothing. Um, that really caused him real trouble. And um, I, I think of it in, this, in the oral histories, I call it invisibility because there were few Puerto Ricans and they were kind of spread around and they didn't seem to know, there were, I mean, I know people, there were some people that knew each other, but there seemed to be this kind of commonly held but individually experienced memory of just being alone. Um, so I kept hearing the same memory over and over again, but they, the memory was, well, there was nobody here. So that's always kind of intriguing to me also. Um, so I think of it as invisibility in that way. It's a bit of a protected invisibility of Puerto Ricans. So then come the 80s and the 90s when the population starts really growing and there are newspapers and there are Spanish language radio stations and clubs, social clubs, and people are having that they become much more visible, right? People are gathering and it's very clear um, that this is a growing population. And, and at this point, the oral, the oral history evidence tends, tends to show beginnings a real sense of a collective sense of vulnerability, a sense that um, of, of being hyper-visible, uh, you know, when you didn't want to be so visible. Um, and then people would talk about difficulties in finding jobs, and one woman told a story of working in a um, daycare center and she was told not to touch the food. Um, and I think um, one of the, um, Many, some of you might remember this well. I think it was around 2005. There was an elementary school teacher who wrote to her uh, congressional delegation and asked them basically to just get rid of all foreigners. At this point, that black-white binary is maybe morphing into black-white foreign. Right? If you're not black or white, you must be foreign. And um, she singled out Puerto. She singled out many groups, but in her singling out Puerto Ricans, she said that they, she wanted them to change the laws and send them back to Puerto Rico, and they were trashing Orlando daily. That was the way she put it. So obviously this sort of thing created a great outcry from the Puerto Rican community. And, and this is the time where I think, it really back in the 90s, um, when some of these things were starting, that there's the beginnings of a real collective effort to push back and create visibility really on their own terms. Um, so in that sense, I'd say yes, there's subversion that this, the, the black-white maybe starts to break up and there's this establishing some sort of identity that is apart from that, and yet it's still hitting up with these legal structures and the redistricting of the schools committee. Um, so, um, I think that's, that's enough. <laughs> uh, for me, I was curious about how Puerto Ricans and other Latinos navigated the black-white racial binary uh, in the contemporary. So I was looking between about 2010 and 2012. Uh, and I started with census data, and in the census data, overwhelmingly, Puerto Ricans, Latinos, identified as white. Uh, 
again, you know, you've got census data recognizing that Latinos are an ethnic group that can be of any race. So again, I'm saying that people are self-identifying, at least in the census, as white. Um, but then I was curious about how they were perceived by other people. And that's where I started to see basically the social construction of another category, another racial category. Uh, and that was happening through discourse. Um, I would see it in newspaper articles, the way people would talk about the Puerto Rican and larger Latino population um, was that they were neither white nor black. And so they were considered this other group, despite the fact that the people that I was interviewing um, would point to their skin and tell me, look, I'm white, you know, no one's gonna discriminate against me. So they were embracing and wanted to be white passing, um, but the people I would interview uh, that considered themselves non-Hispanic white certainly did not see that population as white. And there was definitely a rejection of blackness. Uh, a lot of it came out in interviews when it came to relationships. To date, friendships, perfectly fine. But when people would talk about interracial relationships is when I would start to hear that rejection of blackness uh, and excuses about why um, someone would not date someone of, of a different race than them. So I started to see, um, and I live in Mississippi. In Mississippi, they say you're either black, white, or Mexican. Here, it was, it was similar in that, again, there was this construction of a different race. And again, we're talking about an ethnic group, but the way people talked about them. Um, it was as if they were a race. And there has been research that shows, for instance, that in the South, Latinos are more likely to claim that white racial identity than in places like New York. So there's some statistical difference there. And again, I would question, is it because they're in the South? You know, is there an awareness or a consciousness of, of a history that makes people want to be white passing, perhaps? So there was some challenges there and some tensions that I saw, um, but overwhelmingly, the Puerto Rican and Latino population was seen as neither white nor black, but as its own race, so to speak, and treated that way. And it was largely, and we'll talk about this more, but largely due to language, language use, is what racialized people in that way. Actually, that's a perfect segue to this question, which is more for you, Simone. Um, you both discussed to varying extents the role of language in the process of racialization. So could you go maybe a little more into detail about how language brought groups together, but also how it might di how it divided groups from one another? Yeah, and I have to say, I ended up with an entire chapter in my book about language, and I do not speak Spanish. And I did not want to speak, I did not want to speak uh, Spanish as a child. I very much rejected it. Uh, I grew up in an English-speaking household because my mother uh, spoke Haitian Creole, my father at best Spanglish, me on a good day, maybe a little bit of Spanglish, I can speak. Um, but again, I do not want to touch language because I'm not fluent. I didn't know how to communicate in that type of way, what kinds of questions to ask. But I couldn't ignore it because it kept coming up. And so what I ended up looking at were language ideologies, which linguistic anthropologists often study. Uh, and what language ideologies, so basically our ideas, our thoughts about language, but often we put language into a hierarchy. Um, that's why you have English only. Uh, movements because people believe there are certain spaces where it's okay to speak English uh, or Spanish or maybe spaces where you're not supposed to speak uh, a foreign language. So I became very interested in interviewing folks that were both non-Hispanic white uh, and uh, Hispanic or Latino to see uh, how they felt about the use of Spanish in their communities. And that's where people became very vocal about their opposition to the migration. They felt, I mean, I would hear things like, oh, this is turning into another Miami, for instance, uh, where the Cuban population is dominant. Uh, in the community where I was living in Buenaventura Lakes, the people I would interview would talk to me about how they would go into a bank or into a supermarket and be greeted in Spanish. And they were horrified by that. They felt like their community was changing and they felt like they were now the foreigners uh, in a space that they used to call home and a place that had been their home for decades. So those language ideologies became really, really prevalent. Uh, and in my interviews, I think sometimes because people would always ask me, do you speak Spanish or not? And I'd say no. And then they would open up about the fact that they felt um, a certain kind of way about this hyper-presence of the Spanish language in certain communities. Uh, and so those language ideologies not only othered the population, but I realized it started to lead to the development of a stronger white racial consciousness. 
So the non-Hispanic white people I, were, I was interviewing, um, you know, they would talk about reverse discrimination. Uh, they would talk about how the Latino population had a labor market advantage now. Because you would drive down the street or you would look at a newspaper advertisement and see things like a sign that says bilingual encouraged or we're looking for bilingual folks uh, for this particular real estate uh, agency because obviously you need to market to the population that's living there. Um, but I would hear things about reverse discrimination. So language ended up being a huge tension in the community uh, that really separated Puerto Ricans and Latinos from uh, long-term residents in the community. Uh, again, because it was so hyper-present. So for me, it ended up really being a point of contention. Uh, it did cause a lot of tension. Um, but within the Latino community, certainly that was something that bonded folks. Uh, the fact that you know they were there and for some people learning English for the first time uh, and intentionally living in communities that were um, very much Spanish-speaking spaces and places because that's where uh, they could open a business and they could conduct daily business and go through daily life you know, in the language that's familiar and comfortable. So within the Latino population, I saw that language brought people together, but it also caused a lot of tensions uh, between the white population and, and the Puerto Rican Latino population I was studying. And it led to racialization. So language oftentimes was the reason why people um, would consider Puerto Ricans not white. The other thing that I found a lot when I was looking at real estate, um, I was looking at how people perceived communities that were concentrated with Puerto Ricans. And oftentimes I would see those posts where someone would ask, oh, you know, is Buenaventura Lakes a good place to live? Should I buy there? You know, these houses are really inexpensive compared to other places. And people would respond, well, if you don't speak Spanish, you probably don't want to live there. So it was always language. They wouldn't say it's concentrated with Latinos and Puerto Ricans. They would say it's about language. Do you speak the language? If not, don't go there. And I realized they were deterring people. People were actually choosing not to live in these communities because they were afraid that it was so dominant with the Spanish language. So it ended up leading to segregation in housing because of these language ideologies and this fear of being in a community that's concentrated with Spanish speakers. So, yeah. Fascinating. Um, I'm curious, you there's questions for Patricia. Both of you acknowledge that Puerto Ricans coming from Puerto Rico and those moving from the Northeast often came with different notions and understandings of what Puerto Rico and its culture meant to them, and that these groups didn't necessarily blend as one diasporic community. Can you speak a bit about this process of these groups coming together in one space? Um, and I'm just I'm thinking that I ended a comment earlier about saying this was a new space for everybody, and this is really right. kind of very relates to, to this topic. Um, the, th there's a there's a Puerto Rican scholar who ref refers to the, um, the ways in which Puerto Rican history, from island-based Puerto Rican history, tends to forget about the diaspora. Doesn't doesn't, and he refers to that as Puerto Rico's broken memory. And um, I think to to try to delve into that a bit, I'm, I'm going to go back to this comment about the narrative from the, about the 90s and about the 80s and 90s being a professional migration from Puerto Rico, and that that used to baffled me a bit at the time when I first got here because I kept hearing that narrative, which again was not untrue, that there were many professionals coming from Puerto Rico in that period of time. But the census data and what Jorge Duani was finding and, and what I was looking at was clearly stating that it was kind of 50-50 where people had been born. So you have this um, identity movement in a sense saying there are all these Puerto Ricans here, but kind of half of them weren't being counted really. So they were good when we talked about the, the number, but not when we talked about our interactions. So that kind of puzzled me um, <laughs> as I continue to do the research. And I think um, probably you're all aware of this, but if you're not, I'll kind of, in Puerto Rico, the idea of the New Yorican, right, that it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very negative image and it's associated with, and it tends to get used frequently to talk about anybody who's from the diaspora, right? And I think this was, this was somewhat um, prompted by return migrations from New York and other places to Puerto Rico in like the 60s and 70s and so. So, um, so it, it's associated with darkness, poverty, and not speaking Spanish well, actually. 
Um, and so that's a place where, in terms of what I was thinking about with language, was the ways in which language was dividing the Puerto Rican community. You said yourself you didn't actually even learn Spanish, right? Um, and I would meet people who had been um, born and grown up in other places, in, I mean, outside of Puerto Rico, and they, they would somehow, they were, they were kind of buying into that they would, there was this equal sense of Puerto Ricanness and what's important. Um, but some of the diaspora-born people would be like, well, I don't really know my culture. I don't, I don't know enough. Um, and they were bringing very different ideas of what it means to be Puerto Rican to this space. Um, the, the discrimination, or the, maybe that's, yeah, I guess that's an okay word for that, against the Puerto Ricans coming from the diaspora. Mm -hmm. um, well, and actually, let me put in one caveat, too. We tend to do that, diaspora and island, and in fact, people go back and forth all the time. There's a lot of circular migration, and, um, one of the people that I met early on, uh, who has, um, uh, he, he was, had moved here from Puerto Rico, he was really, really, he was a big promoter in the community, he was, he was a good bit older than I was, and he has since passed away, but he, he'd been here for a long time, he'd done lots of um, work for the Puerto Rican community, and he pulls out of his pocket one day, he's laminated, newspaper clipping when he was one of the first one, he was the first one to register for the Puerto Rican Parade in New York. And I, that's where I learned more of his New York story. I didn't always know that part of the story, right? So I heard a lot about Puerto Rico, the island. But, so people, people move back and forth all the time. But the, so the pushback sometimes that you hear from people from the diaspora is, you know, we're tough, we're savvier, we understand how to navigate the kind of the kinds of discrimination that, that we face in the United States, or in the, in the U.S. states, I put it that way, because Puerto Rico is part of the United States. But, um, so uh, there's that pushback, and then the people in Puerto Rico can push back and say, you know, things aren't so easy here, you know, we have it tough too, and try being independent vista in Puerto Rico and see if you don't need a pretty thick skin, you know. So you get, you get these comments, and I, I think, one of the stories that I love from my, this wasn't even really my field work, except I was living my field work because I was teaching here. But I had a, I had a class in, um, that was called Puerto Rican Culture, which I always thought was a bit of a pretentious title. But we talked a lot about history, and um, we, we looked at this broken memory um, between, uh, in, the, in Puerto Rican history. And I had only five students in the class, and two of them were born in Puerto Rico, and two of them were born in the diaspora, and the fifth one I never could quite figure out. He never kind of answered that question directly, but he knew a lot. He, he should have been teaching the class. He had been everywhere, and he knew everything about every Puerto Rican community. So we're sitting in class one day, and we've been talking about, you know, this, what, what does it mean to be Puerto Rican? What, when you hear that word, you know, everybody in this room says you're Puerto Rican, what does that mean? And the, one, of the, one of the women who was born in the diaspora, and I think she, I think she was from New York, if I remember right, and born and bred there. I think, I'm not sure how much she'd ever been to Puerto Rico. And she points at one of the other women in the class who had probably been in order to come from Puerto Rico, maybe been, been there a few months, or maybe a year, and she said, I don't know what Puerto Rican is, but I am nothing like her. Uh, right? And it, it, was, it was really a moment that, that pointed out that there was a common sense in this classroom of common heritage and yet a very different sense of who we are. Um, and I think along with this professional migration narrative that I keep going back to, the other thing I kept hearing was, um, this is among the people that were really activists, you know, and some of the people I met on the bus to Brooksville, and the people that were really trying to, to work for this visibility in their own terms, and they'd say, we're not united. We're, everybody's fighting with everybody. It's a balde de bueyes. It's a bucket of crabs. And they would use that that metaphor of what, you know, it's instead of pull, helping people out, people are pulling people down and, and, and not getting together. And that, um, that one also, because I did see a lot of collaboration along with um, infighting, and I, I, again, was a bit baffled, but I, I started to think of it a lot as, um, Couple things, I guess. One, and that this is a metaphor of crabs in the bucket that are used, that is used in many, and it's used around the Caribbean. And actually, I was recently reading *Cast* by Isabel Wilkerson, and she talks about it. This happening among, uh, often in marginalized communities, right? Um, that there's this effort to not be the one on the bottom, not to be the one on the bottom. And I started to think about it as, well. What's happening outside that bucket? What, who's turning up the heat? 
that is making it very difficult for any crab in that bucket, John, he keep saying crabs, but for any person in a difficult situation to try to constantly be connecting with others when they, their, their own issues of just getting out of a mess are, are part of what's going on. So I started thinking about it that way. And, and there, so with all of that, it's not, that makes it sound like there's never anybody getting along. And it's just, that's not true. <laughs> so Jorge Duani talked a lot, he talked about intermarriages and people, you know, he kind of came, again, you have this discussion of diaspora and the island and then, but yeah, there's intermarriages and people joke around a lot. And one of my favorite stories was a, a man here who is uh, very influential in, influential in Puerto Rican Orlando. He grew up in New York, born and bred. And, they're going, he tells about it, they're going around a room and uh, everybody's talking about where their hometown is and they get to him and he says the Bronx. And the whole room burst out laughing because they were not expecting somebody to say someone anywhere other than a town in Puerto Rico, right? Um, and that same person started New York night that happened for, it doesn't happen anymore, at least, is it? I think that stopped. But it was, it happened regularly uh, at the Asociación Borinquena, which is that big building on Colonial Manicón that you see just off of Colonial. Um, which is no longer the Association of Kenya either, but um, they, there was a regular New York mm -hmm. night, and everybody came to New York night. It wasn't just something for New Yorkers, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so I guess um, just to wrap up, I, I want, I'm going to again step back and remind us that this particular diaspora community was forming at a time. At first, it's new to everybody who's coming here, and it's happening at a time where this black-white binary is kind of morphing into um, to borrow the term from Charles Hale, what I call multicultural neoliberalism. Um, and what I mean by that is a lip service to difference um, with an assumption of human sameness. So it's only difference if I've said the difference is okay, right? if I have the power to do that. So it's lip service to difference with an assumption of human sameness that is embedded in a system that is reproducing structural inequality. And that is what, uh, to me, that's the 80s, the 90s, going into the 21st century. That is what's happening here. And so when we try to understand the fighting that might go on among people that are just trying to make it here, I think it's important to understand you know, who's turning up the heat outside the pot, we'll put it that way. Um, and the one, just to, to finish, I'll kind of go to Hurricane Maria, which was a huge thing. And I think it said it always, me, it just kind of drew a line between then and now. So everything I've been talking about was kind of then. Um, and Fernando Rivera did an amazing, um, I'm sorry you weren't all there today, presentation on the work done in Orlando um, and, and to receive the people from Puerto Rico who were coming here. So that was really, really good today. Um, and I, this is kind of my probably Pollyanna moment, but I always, even before Hurricane Maria, I did wonder if if Orlando maybe isn't a space that can help heal the broken you know, and, and I think Hurricane Maria showed that in many ways. I don't know if you kind of referred to data, maybe not so much that way anymore. But there was at least a moment where these two groups were very much working together. And there was a recognition on the island of how much they need to be. So the, we are going to take audience questions, uh, but we're going to go through two or three more questions before we do that. Uh, Simone, this one's for you. Um, you addressed the topic of intra-Latino relations in your uh, study, and you spoke about instances in which Latinos come together, for example, the, around the, the issue of language. Uh, but there were also um, places where relations were fragmented. Could you speak about the sources of solidarity and division among different Latino subgroups, and maybe also address the issue of social class? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, I chose Central Florida because of the social class position uh, that Jorge Duani, for example, was talking about. Uh, the community I chose, I thought I was going to be studying up and going to a space uh, where upper class folks were living, um, and I learned very, very quickly that it was perceived very, very differently um, by folks that actually lived here in Florida. There was fear of gangs and crime and all the things I heard in inner city New York City. Uh, inner, in the inner city of New York, um, being played out in the suburbs of uh, one of Ventura Lakes in Osceola County. So I had to look for folks um, that would be an opportunity to quote unquote study up, study professionals, doctors, lawyers. So I ended up finding spaces like the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Uh, there was another group called Amigos Profesionales. Um, there was the Puerto Rican Chamber of Commerce. So I started targeting those folks. 
uh, and doing participant observation in those spaces. And that's where I saw a divide based on social class that was very, very prevalent. Um, I found that Puerto Ricans were sometimes looked down upon by other Latinos. They were seen as being very privileged because they had citizenship, but also seen as some of those typical tropes you hear in New York as, as taking advantage of welfare, um, you know, being lazy. So a lot of those things came out um, from folks that were not Puerto Rican but identified as Latino, where they looked down uh, on the Puerto Rican population. Also, I realized a lot of times those folks um, were sometimes working underneath people who were Puerto Rican. So there was also a hierarchy in terms of labor. Um, but in terms of social class, I also found this distancing within the Puerto Rican population, where those professionals, I remember one individual in the interview saying to me, you know, I love my salsa music, I love my Puerto Rican food, I love Puerto Rican culture, doesn't mean I have to live with them. And I saw that very intentionally with some of the um, professionals, where they were trying to get away from those Puerto Rican concentrated communities. They wanted to be, they wanted to protect maybe property values. Um, but again, they wanted to be in spaces where they were not going to be around a lot of Latinos and other Puerto Ricans. So I saw that social class divide, and I only saw it when I was studying and interacting with folks that were part of those organizations. Um, but again, in terms of Latinos, Puerto Ricans, I would find those positions. But a lot of it would be, again, um, because of citizenship and you know, ideas that these folks are privileged but are not taking advantage of that privilege. Whereas, again, my one roommate was undocumented, um, you know, having money taken out of his check because of the contractor who he was employed by, you know, not directly by the hotel. So again, seeing that uh, the people above him were actually employed by the hotel, but they were Puerto Rican. Mm -hmm. So there was those types of tensions over labor, over opportunity. Um, but again, coming down to citizenship sometimes, and that would be the difference. So two concluding questions, and we'll open it up to the audience. And, and one of them we didn't talk about, but I'm going to throw it your way, because it, it, all of this discussion made me think about it. But for people here aspiring to do research in this area, what research questions would you say are the ones that haven't been looked at? given the state of the field, given the studies that you've done, and, and sort of open the pathway. Because you both have really built on the work. You mentioned Horn Haglani. You mentioned work done previous that opened the doors to your work. What doors are now open? What research questions remain unanswered that you say new generations? Pay attention to grad students. These are the dissertation <laughs> questions that, that you all want to be studying, right? What are the, these questions that we need to look into going forward? I will say for me, there is an absence in my book in terms of the African-American population community. How are they interacting with Puerto Ricans? And I remember in my research, you know, looking at the different um, identity uh, categories people would mark. I had one person who identified as Jimmy Kidd. That was it in terms of my interviewees. So I found kind of this segregation between the African American population and the Puerto Rican and Latino population. But again, these folks are working in the same spaces, they are interacting, but I wasn't getting that data. So I think that's something that's missing. The other thing is I dealt with people who were pretty much 18 and above. And I remember just one incident where I had an opportunity um, to volunteer at a high school in Osceola County. And so I took that opportunity to just tell the students about my research. And one of the students, and again, they're under 18, one of them um, just says to the whole class, mind you, it's a very diverse class, he says, this is America, you need to speak English. And he tells the class this, and he says, you know what, if I'm in Bravo or one of the Spanish supermarkets, it's okay if I hear Spanish, but if I'm in the Walmart, I don't want to hear it. And so I started to think about the younger generation. What is the experience um, of folks like me? I'm third generation. So what about the folks who didn't migrate here directly, you know, from New York or, or from Puerto Rico? What about the Florida Ricans? So that younger generation, what is happening to them? How are they maybe um, being integrated into the community? So that was the one thing, the younger population, um, very absent from my research. And then in terms of race relations, I looked at the interactions between the white population, non Latino white, and Latino, but never the African American population, and seeing how you know, that actually worked together. <coughs> so that would be think, a huge, a huge area to, mm -hmm. to our investigation. Um, I totally agree with that. And actually, the opening scenario in my book talks about um, 
this is, and I'm going to tie this into politics because my, my, I think the question that I would like to see us pursue is politically, it's about race and politics. Um, and, and when my, the opening part of my book, I just told the story about election night 2012, where I was at a church with a mostly Spanish speaking population, wound around the church, one little machine, not working, you know, we all know the story of voter suppression. So that was going on, um, and, but the, the whole scenario was about white and Puerto Rican and Latino interactions. And I described it that way because this was going on in East Orlando. And so this was a point, this was, and I said, you know, noticeably absent from this scenario is the African American population, the black, black population that has more traditionally been in West Orlando. So that, that I mean, that's not true that there's no, you know, there's no mixing at all geographically, but I thought that was an important thing to make in terms of, again, the racial history of the city and then Puerto Ricans kind of arriving and going in sometimes to newer spaces too. Um, but I think, so at the time that I was doing my research politically, there was all this talk about the sleeping giant waking up, right? All, you know, the, the Latinos, Puerto Ricans, every, and every four years, they, everybody would arrive here. And they used to, they would always go to Miami, but then they started coming to Orlando, right? So um, that, those questions would come up every four years. And um, it was this, behind that was this assumption that Latinos are all the same and are all gonna vote the same. So clearly what we've been talking about is this is not true. <laughs> it's not even true among Puerto Ricans, forget all Latinos. It's just not gonna, that's not the way it works. Um, and I think it was with where we are now, um, and that that recognition of the heterogeneity is, is much more clearly out there um, through lots of scholarship. And I, so I, what I wish I had been able to do um, is, and this is, so I, I'm wondering how, different Puerto Rican and Latino racial identification, and I use the word identification and not identity on purpose right there. It's, it's how do people identify, not kind of how is somebody maybe seeing you and labeling you. Um, so how do the individual Puerto Rican and Latino racial identifications impact political choices? And I felt like I saw a little bit of that in the redistricting battle that I watched, um, and I'm wondering to what degree somebody is trying to be white passing, might, and, and there was, uh, I think it was during, it must have been the 2016 election. <laughs> it's all blurring together in my head these days, but yeah, it was the 2016 election, I was driving around, listening to Spanish radio, and, and there was one announcer, there was a caller calling in, and, and uh, the announcer said, you know, voting for Trump isn't gonna make you white. Ah. And I thought that was a really, I, I mean, he just came out and said it, and I, I hadn't kind of thought about it that way, but it was an interesting, um, and I hope it's okay that I said that. <laughs> so, so that's that's the question I think really does need to be asked. What is what is the connection between individual racial identifications and political choices? Wow. Uh, just one last question, and we'll turn it over to the audience. Uh, looking back on the research process for these books, is there anything you would change or do differently if you had the opportunity to do the study all over again? Well, I think uh, I, mean, I think the, your point of the absence of blackness in the studies, right there, there are ways to have made that happen. And as I was doing the research, it took a really long time, and things would keep. I'd be like, oh, I don't know anything about that, and I think, oh, I have to add that in now. <laughs> you know? So, so I'd say for me, it was. It, I would love to see more. Uh, I wish I had done more. And kind of black Latino uh, and black Puerto Rican um, work. Um, and, and I think also Pulse happened right after. I, I was really, I pretty much finished my field work. I was in New York when it happened. I came back here. And um, one thing I really realized in that process was, I mean, I, I'd been aware that I wasn't really dealing with LGBTQ issues either. There was, there was a lot that was, and there was a lot of issues for women that I would have liked to have gotten into. There's a lot of things. Um, but when Pulse happened, what I also realized was it wasn't so much these groups within the Puerto Rican community, because I knew gay and lesbian Puerto Ricans and you know, that we had conversations, but I hadn't thought about their interaction with the larger LGBTQ community in Orlando. And um, there was one person who told me a story right away, she heard about Pulse, she went straight to the center that was on Mills, I'm not sure if it's still there. Um, and you know, she wanted to be there, she knew people there, but she's looking around, she's like, well, wait a minute, I don't Nobody here looks like me. Uh, 
um, and and the the Puerto Ricans were somewhere else, um, and and they were people that were gathering and starting to offer translation help and so forth. Um, so that's something that I think um, I wish I had been able to delve into more, but it was late in my research that some of those questions started arriving for me, and again, yeah, dissertation ideas, everybody. <laughs> For me, certainly, again, the absence of certain populations, but I wish I would have done more with entrepreneurship and food waste. And that's something I'm doing now with Memphis, and I'm comparing Jewish population and the Mississippi Delta Chinese population and the Mexican population, and I'm seeing how important entrepreneurship in terms of restaurants and other businesses are to upward mobility for these groups. And I was interested in professionals, but again, they were maybe lawyers, doctors, they weren't necessarily business owners. So that's something that I think is really important. I'm seeing these other populations, that was how they made it in the Deep South, through those opportunities. So I want to be able to compare now, you know, is that something that is possible here? And food in particular, is food uh, in food waste something that can create um, alliances? You know, are these people cultural brokers? Because when you talk about food, people lean in. You know, they're like, okay, but you say we're going to talk about race relations, and people are like, oh, okay. So I wish I would have taken a subject like food ways to get at some of these harder issues. So yeah, anyone's interested in studying food ways and entrepreneurship and, and small businesses, I think there's a lot of potential there. And applied work that can be done. You know, community-engaged research where you're actually trying to empower the folks that you're working with instead of what I do or have done is really just documenting what they say, what's happening, versus creating change. Uh, questions from the public? Uh, I don't know if there's someone. Uh, yeah, please go ahead. Uh. I'm not a graduate student anymore. <laughs> I, uh, I just happen to be from Puerto Rico, born and raised there. And um, my, I, I moved to the States when I joined the Navy. And they thought it was in the Puerto Rican Navy, which is something I never thought of. But it was the U.S. Navy. Um, and you were talking about the broken memory, is that what it was called? The, the diaspora? The, um, I think we had a diaspora. It wasn't caused by us. It was caused that we were, for over 500 years, we were Spanish. And then all of a sudden, 1898, boom, we're American. Well, it wasn't official, but we were. <laughs> and so that created a big schism in us. You know, and I was born much after the, you know, that happened, and not much after. <laughs> <laughs> I I think that the idea of becoming an American and being an American, we are American citizens, and the statehood situation. That's another thing that could be researched. Is state statehood for Puerto Rico? Puerto Rico didn't want to be a state. We had all the privileges of statehood. You know, welfare, U.S. dollars, post office, everything is American. But we didn't have to pay taxes, federal taxes, because we are not represented. So I think, to me, I want to become a state. People ask, do you want Puerto Rico to be a state? Yes, I do, because then I would be considered an American. I'm getting tired of being think, people thinking that I'm not an American. I'm very proud of being an American. I think most Puerto Ricans are. And that, have you ever checked into that uh, statement mm -hmm. uh, question? Yeah. For me, no, I haven't. I haven't. Um, yeah, that's actually part of, I mean, it, I came here from Puerto Rico, so that, that uh -huh. well, I mean, I'm not Puerto Rican, but I was, that's where I've been living, and so I had right. learned a lot about Puerto Rican status politics. Um, and I got really interested in kind of the, uh, I, I, this is going to sidetrack a little bit. I mean, I, I'm not sure what you mean by studying about statehood because clearly that's well, a huge issue. Yeah, it's a, okay. It has changed tremendously. Yeah, that has changed, and I, I did. I had some very surprising kind of conversations along the way, and I had had many in, in Puerto Rico. What I what really I got interested in was again thinking politically, the two different kind of political systems, if you will, there and here, and how do they how do they mesh or influence each other. And I, like one thing I noticed that because in Puerto Rico, these pro-statehood people are often referred to as republicanos, 
then somebody was pro-statehood would move here, and I heard that story many times, and register as Republican, and sometimes stay that way, and sometimes one day say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, no, 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 and either become independent or switch to be Democrat. Um, and um, so that, inter and, and, and I think it's really hard for people in the United States to understand that in Puerto Rico, political system revolves around your, your positions and status, or at least has. I have a feeling that's starting to shift a little bit, but um, I'm not totally up to date on that. But, but so, so no, I wasn't studying that as a question, but it certainly became part of the conversations I was having with people, along with knowing, you know, having people who were firmly, in, they wanted independence, and they were here you know, trying to get the political, doing, doing activism Did here. Did hmm? they give a reason for being independent? Um, they think Puerto Rico should be its own. I mean, I, I mean you've had these conversations. You've had them with everybody, yeah. right? So everybody has a reason why they're pro statehood, why they're pro commonwealth, why they want independence, right? Um, and it continues to be a pretty hot issue. In, uh, yeah. I have never felt that for myself as a non Puerto Rican, I had a right to have a real opinion, to tell you the truth. So I, I, I part, in part, don't delve into those conversations. I'm aware of the conversation, certainly, because I've lived it. But, um, I haven't ever felt that I myself should have an opinion. Everybody should know we can't vote for president if we live in Puerto Rico. Yeah. Well, and when you were saying earlier what you could and couldn't do, I was going to point out in the days of the draft, you could be drafted, but you couldn't vote oh, yeah. for president. So, yeah. yeah well, my father's in the army. Yeah. yeah. I think it's interesting that you said you don't feel you have a right to say it because I remember being, when I was doing research, folks that were New Rican, I'm considered New Rican, um, or in the diaspora would kind of get. I just remember that attitude, like you don't have a right to say because you're not from Puerto Rico. You've never lived there. So I do remember that attitude sometimes where I was around a lot of people that are from the diaspora, New York, Chicago, and they really were absent, you know, from that conversation. But sometimes feeling like, like you said, you know, I, I don't, I'm not from there. So it's not my place to have a position. So, but yeah, that's part of Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for a fascinating conversation. I say that's a long-term Central Floridian question of the about these subjects. And you both have a more considered business. I have two questions that I think are interconnected. Um, when PBS showed Ken Burns Buffalo this week, there were a lot of questions about what right he had to tell the story, which should be an indigenous story. And the issue of who has the right to tell the story of groups, um, ethnic groups, cultural groups, races. First thing I was wondering was whether or not you've done any thinking about that. I hear some of it, some of the language people have used in giving their answers. And the second was that both of you, it seems to me, um, gained a great deal by movement, by going away coming back, and 50 years ago I had a really great lunch with James Baldwin, who told me that um, you can't know America unless you get out of it. And I wonder how much truth you think is in that. And it's part of how we, um, how we choose the topics we want to work about, you know, that, and what perspective and stance we should have. Should we start? <laughs> I mean, I know for me, in terms of my own positionality, I was always very self-reflexive about that. Um, kind of from the anthropologic training, they encourage you to be open, and you know, even in the book, write about your identity and how you're maybe not objective because of it. But I always saw myself as both like an insider and an outsider. Um, people would see me as part of the diaspora, they would label me as a New Yorkian. Um, the fact that I didn't speak Spanish sometimes helped me because Puerto Ricans would be disappointed at my Americanization and assimilation, so they would want to take me under their wing and try and teach me and feed me. So it sometimes worked to my advantage, um, being kind of an outsider in that respect. Um, but then they would look at me and still see someone who's Latina. So still, I would get doors open in some sense for me. Um, so that was, you know, kind of working on both positions. Moving to Mississippi, though, which is where I've lived for the last 10 years, um, and doing work in Memphis. Yeah, it's been 10 years in Mississippi, and I love the Deep South. Who would have thought? But that has really helped me compare 
you know, how different and how place specific the process is for different Latino groups to be incorporated socially, politically, and economically into a space and place. And like I said, Mississippi are black, white, or Mexican. Um, I'm white passing, I went there, my mom's Haitian, I was taught I'm black. And that's what I would say to people in Mississippi. And I have been told so many times, no, you're not. And don't you say that here. So again, whereas the context, yeah, absolutely. You're looking at me, I'm like, yeah, like, <laughs> I have been corrected by folks. And because I'm white passing there. And so how I'm perceived is very, very different in conversations. I mean, the words I hear over Thanksgiving dinners, the use of language and slurs is so present. Um, I mean, I, I've been shocked being in, in Mississippi. So again, I've seen how place specific things can be and how the experience just differs so much um, based on where you're actually located in the South. So there are many Souths. That's kind of how I think about it. I think um, your, your comment about needing to get out of America, um, and, and the right to tell the story I think I've touched on, I, I have, and, and I, same thing, I've been kind of encouraged to go ahead because I'm an outsider and because I don't always have a status agenda for Puerto Rican politics and so forth. Um, so I, I'm very aware of that, certainly. Um, and um, there are parts of the story that I, in my book, I tried to, to um, find things that people had said, even if I thought them, I tried to find them, be able to put them in the words of the people that I was talking to instead of skating up as my opinion or whatever. But, um, but I'd like to address the Out of America because that's exactly why I went to Puerto Rico in the first place. So I was actually, um, I lived in France for a long time. I was a French teacher. I spoke French. I spoke French better than I will ever speak Spanish. Although nowadays it comes out in Spanish. And then I decided to be an older, I was an older graduate student, and I decided to be an anthropologist. And, and it was time to pick where I was going to do my research, what my topic was going to be, where I was going to go. And um, I had had that experience of learning about the United States by not living in the United States. So I had that perspective, uh, at least from France. But um, it was, anyway, I could go on about that. I won't, I won't go on about that more. But, um, but then I was trying to figure out, because I had also had an experience, um, I, was, I was at a place called the School for International Training, I've been, a, I've been a student forever, I just keep going from one school to another, so I was at a place called the School for International Training, and I, I had become very aware with a classroom full of people from all over the world, and at that point my real feeling that the U.S. is kind of the belly of the beast, and I, I felt like my work needed to be directed somehow to fix that, so here's my dilemma. I think you have to be outside the United States to see the United States, but you have to be in the United States to really work on fixing things in the United States. And I was having a conversation with somebody and they said, what about Puerto Rico? <laughs> and something in my gut, I didn't know anything about Puerto Rico at the time, I know a lot more now, but um, something in my gut just said yes. Um, and, and I started, I was in a class and I was trying to find out about, I was, it was a class on education, international education, and we decided to have Puerto Rico be the place we went for our research and not go there physically. But, and of course we had to get permission because it's not international, it's probably the United States. And then we started looking for the literature on it, and it wasn't in the international literature, and it wasn't in the domestic literature, and then that's from there that it began to really um, come home to me that this work was really important. And so then, as a teacher, I always bring up Puerto Rico. So there I am, as a non-Puerto Rican, telling that story over and over again. So, yeah. so obviously, the changes in demographics and the increase in Puerto Rican population is having an impact on Florida on a multitude of levels. But I'm curious if you could predict and or guess, like, now in your 2023 that we are, like, what has this Puerto Rican population done to Florida identity and what it means to be Floridian at this point? Um, and not just you know, Cuban. I think it's probably the equivalent you would say in these instances in Florida if you were you know, if you're Latino on that front. So what has Puerto Rican identity done to change the actual identity of Florida now at this point? I fight with my students all the time. We do an exercise where they have to look at the geography of the South and determine um, you know, what states are part of the South, what is Southern, um, and they consistently exclude Florida. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, and some of them just cut it, like a piece of it off. So Northern Florida, yes, 
that's part of the South. And what I found is they used to just cut off Miami, now they cut out Orlando. So in their mind, you're no longer in the South. But it's, you know, and then I ask them why, and it always comes down to the people. And it's, they won't say it directly, you know, they'll say things like, oh, well, they have beaches down there. I'm like, well, there's beaches in the Gulf Coast and in the South, too. You know, it's not that it doesn't exist. But I think the population of people that they perceive as foreign, even though we're talking about Puerto Ricans, they still see that as foreign. That makes it less Southern. So they're not seeing these folks, even if they've, you know, been here since, like you're saying, generations, they're still not seen as Southern. So I think there's an exclusion of Florida because of the population. Um, My first thought when you asked that was, anthropologists don't make predictions. <laughs> <laughs> we, just, we just ask questions. <laughs> so, so um, yeah, and I, and I do feel that um, most recently, I haven't been here as much, and so I don't know that I can speak to really, I, I think, what's happened most recently. Fernando's um, comments about the impact, or actually lack of impact, as how you described it, of the surge in Puerto Rican migration here following Hurricane Maria, you had, I don't know if you want to speak to that, or you had surprising results. Um, no, so, I mean, in terms of the impact, right, I'm just going to tell you, like, in the 2018 election, or the 2016 election, Orlando Sentinel, two weeks before the election, they picked out the top issues concerning Puerto Ricans in the next election. You know who's there? Puerto Rico. So talk about impact in terms of that. Obviously a lot has changed since 2016. Yeah. And you know, one of the, some of the research that we did is that like, at that time, Puerto Ricans were probably at the, at the height of visibility, mm -hmm. political potential. Uh, everybody was looking at Puerto Rico here in Maria, what was happening. Now nobody necessarily something about Puerto Rico, we're talking about all the regions also, so. And how things do, how fast they can change in just five years. Obviously we had pandemic, we had all these sort of things, you know, we have a, a lot of political stuff out of here, you know, Florida instead of a swing state, it's a red state, so politically really doesn't matter. Uh, they don't need Puerto Ricans anymore. Uh, either Democrats or Republicans, right? Because there's no swing uh, anymore. So a lot of that changed. In terms of that, but if you look locally at the impact, look at the Orange County uh, uh, School, uh, look at the commissioners. Uh, our vice uh, manager is Puerto Rican. I think three of the five are Puerto Rican, Puerto Rican women. Uh, the sheriff of Silva County is Puerto Rican. Uh, so there's uh, been an impact, you know, in, in, you know, I think locally, regionally here, uh, you can follow your consent and go to, uh, Go to downtown land or go to 436 and tell me you don't buy uh, uh, some type of Puerto Rican food or some type of Puerto Rican. Uh, uh, and we don't have to go far, right? You see, as a Hispanic serving institution, almost 30% of our student body comes from Hispanic. Uh, Latino background is a financial need. But I would say that Puerto Ricans were the ones that led the way for, for, for UCF even to become a Hispanic serving institution. You're saying what, what it's done to Central Florida, we could also say what it's done for Central Florida, right? So, <laughs> um, and that was really, I think, among my reasons in the beginning, that's kind of what I thought, not just how is this changing Puerto Ricans who come here, but how are Puerto Ricans changing where we are. because there would be kind of this New Yorkian versus Islander identity. So, and it's not that they would always get along or, you know, have similar experiences even. So I could see where 
I mean, personally, I can relate to that. But. Well, yeah. You're saying so that it's the diaspora of Puerto Ricans who are telling you you're a Puerto Rican descent. Is that what you're saying? And the Puerto Ricans are saying you're Puerto Rican? Did I hear you right? Yeah, I've heard, I've had other people who um, are, who are born maybe here in Florida, mm -hmm. but were raised in Puerto Rico, or at least lived several years in Puerto Rico. As opposed to me, I only went to Puerto Rico for the summer. Right. And so I'm not Puerto Rican enough. Oh, you're not enough mm -hmm. to them. Okay, I get yeah. that. I get mm -hmm. that. Okay, I maybe mean, misheard you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So did you find, uh, especially since you did your research on the island, um, was there ever any discussion on Puerto Rico on the island that <coughs> Those of us that were born and raised here are the Well, that's a little bit, yeah, I mean, that's that kind of negative that I'm a Puerto Rican, which unfortunately you are also, I should say, unfortunately, but then, you know, it doesn't matter where you're from, you're a Puerto Rican. I, I actually had, this, there was a teacher that I uh, worked with when I was doing my dissertation research on the island, and um, she had spent her, I don't know if she was born in Chicago or just spent all of her formative years there, I think at about age 16, she moved back to Puerto Rico, and She'd been there at that point for a really long time, and she was um, very well respected. She was a great teacher. She was very well respected. Kids loved her, colleagues loved her, and everything else. Um, but there was a joking thing. They would just call her the Americans. That was it. She was the American. <laughs> so, um, so, but I mean, that was joking in that way. But certainly, that division is there. Um, and yet, as I was saying, I was talking about the difference between diaspora and Puerto Rico. There's still this collective sense that Puerto Rico is important. Um, and Puerto Ricanness is important. It's just somehow some very different ideas about what exactly constitutes Puerto Ricanness. Now, there's an article written somewhere with a real Puerto Rican please stand up. Forget about that article. But, but, <laughs> yes, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask that question, actually. Um, what it meant to be a Puerto Rican the identity is uh, a subject that in the stories are. Um, since you asked, let me ask you a different question. I do ask similar questions for different parts of the world. Islanders, for example, is always excluded from the mainlanders. That's, that's, uh, that's a fact. Um, my question is about in the historical context. Do you see evolution of uh, Puerto Rican identity? It meant something in the 19th century and it evolved to be what it is today in the 21st century. Is that such an evolution in understanding or describing who a Puerto Rican is? I can remember being like New Yorkans and being made fun of for being flag wavers and like just like they would say we we're overdoing it because we maybe were absent from Puerto Rico and didn't grow up on there, but that's kind of what I what I would receive, almost like we are too proud or, you know, trying to cling to an identity that we don't necessarily know or we're imagining. Um, so yeah, the criticism I would get would, would be that you're just overdoing the pride, um, whereas you shouldn't be doing that. I don't know what and I, I think in terms of change over time, I think, uh, I wish I had a really good answer to that. Another dissertation topic. I really do. I think that that would be. I mean, I know there's been writing about that. I can't tell you exactly. Certainly, just in terms of my own lifetime and the experiences that I've had, I think that. I mean, I think any sense of what any cultural group, whatever label we're. I, I I have trouble with the word identity. I kind of distinguish it from identification, and I did mention that a little earlier. I think identity is a thing, and we use it, and sometimes we use it very well. But identification is something we do. That's about our connecting to other people. So that, I kind of think of it that way. But but I think, um, now I forgot where I was going with that. Oh, <laughs> I knew I was going to do that. But over, over time, I think it's, it, oh, I just, yeah, that's what I was going to say. Just that any cultural group, any identity um, changes constantly. Over so time. you say it's, it's so, fluid. It's fluid. Thank uh, you. So that's the word. That's the word. Uh, in the 19th century, <laughs> what it meant to be Puerto Rican is not the same as. I looked at the same issue on uh, what occurs, what it mm -hmm. uh, how it evolves, mm -hmm. and what uh, other outside um, impacts help him change. Mm -hmm. Could be another question, for example, what changes the understanding of what a Puerto Rican is internally and, mm -hmm. and, and, and then the interaction of, of, let's say, living in the United States. Yeah, and of course, in the 19th century, Puerto Rican was the following the right? So that's Well, we've reached the end of our time, and uh, I want to say.
say, sitting up here in front of all of you, I know how engaged you've been. There has not been a sound in this room for the scholars speaking. So uh, let's get them all up.